Our music team is small but mighty today, so thank you, Sue, for being here. As an affirmation for peace in the Middle East and in solidarity with our Muslim and Jewish brothers and sisters, all of us people of the book, we greet one another. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Shalom. So good morning. As most of you know, I'm Reverend Vicki Elder, and it's my joy and honor to welcome you to Unity of Monterey Bay, a beloved community co-created with love and intention that welcomes all people, all races, nationalities, cultures, and religions, whatever your immigration status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and or abilities. Whether you're here with us in person or joining us virtually, we know that love has no boundaries. We are one in spirit. As a purpose-driven church, Unity of Monterey Bay is an inclusive spiritual community committed to co-creating an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just, and compassionate human presence on this planet. We celebrate our oneness and honor the God of each of our understanding, affirming the innate good and divine essence within each and every individual. Would you please join me in our statement of faith? There is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, expressing as infinite God beyond us, intimate God beside us, inner God being us, divine love in action. Now let's take this affirmation of truth even deeper into our hearts and minds with this blessing by Glenn Carty. Blessed are those that gather. Blessed are those that gather. No security check, no morality check, no financial check. Come as you are. Blessed are those that gather for breakfast on the beach. Ambience is everything. Everything is here needing you. Blessed are those that gather, engulfed by the aromas, by the eclectic tension of unconditional hospitality available with all. Blessed are those that gather and discover the other, going by many names, closer than our breathing, as distant as our fears. God is the giver. God is the guest. God is the grace. God is the grub. God is gift. Now, please join me in affirming together. Thank you, God, for this most amazing day. Miracle follows miracle and wonders never cease. And in this spirit of miracles and wonder, as we tap into that inner child within each of us, we celebrate our children, those in our spiritual community, those in our families, in our larger community, all the children in the world. We hold them in their hearts. We see them protected and resilient, creative and evolving, joyous and loved as we join in our heartfelt blessing. We love you. We bless you. We appreciate you just the way you are. Taking a deep breath in and letting it out with an audible sigh. <sighs> we center ourselves to embrace this blissful interconnection with spirit 
and invite the chime to call us into the sacred space within. We ring the chime four times to call in the four directions and remind us of our interconnection with all of creation and with the sacred circle of life. As we feel it resonate through our very beings, we follow its call into this now present moment within. Continuing to focus on our breath, with each inhale, we open our hearts and minds. We envision our breath reaching every cell of our being. And with each exhale, we see all barriers and obstacles dissolving into this divine flow. And again, as we inhale, we expand the spaciousness within us. We move beyond the limitations and boundaries of our bodies. And as we exhale, we ground ourselves deep within Mother Earth and into our oneness with the universe. Finally, we breathe our awareness into the highest expression of love, light, joy, and peace we can imagine as we experience a transforming wave of gratitude. And with a fullness of heart, we say yes to it all, embracing, claiming, and knowing the divine Christ spirit, expressing in, through, and as us. And with a final exhale, we say thank you, God. Now fully centered and transformed by the power of spirit, we enter into our lesson and meditation time with today's daily word. We read from the April 23rd Daily Word, shared with permission of Unity, publisher of Daily Word. They can also be found at dailyword.com. And the word is faith. I invite you to allow my words to be your words. I stand strong in my faith. If I doubt I have what it takes to live the life of my dreams, I look inside myself to see where I can shift my outlook. I affirm I can accomplish whatever I set my mind to do. I am strong, able, and ready to rise higher and higher. I hold on to the teachings of Jesus whenever I experience doubt or I feel I am not enough. His teachings remind me I am made in the image and likeness of God, just as he was. I am capable not only of doing the amazing things Jesus did, but even more, if I allow myself to believe I can. My faith in myself is the key to abundant living. My faith leads me to believe in myself and in my ability to create the life of my dreams. I, I carry Jesus' words and teachings in my heart. Whatever I put mind and heart to, I can achieve today and every day. And from scriptures, Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. From Mark chapter nine, uh, verse 23.
to the wisdom of the many paths to the sacred, we read from three sacred traditions on this morning's topic, who is, Je who is Jesus to you? From Hinduism, whenever the law declines and the purpose of life is forgotten, I manifest myself on earth. I am born in every age to protect the good to destroy evil and reestablish the law. From Zoroastrianism, <laughs> this man, the Holy One, through righteousness, holds in his spirit the force which heals existence, beneficent unto all as a sworn friend. O oh, wise one. From Christianity, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Caesarea, Philippi, Philippi. <laughs> thank you, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, who do you say that I am? From Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 14, and 15 through 15. is all that you Such a holy place. 
such a holy place. You are deepest joy, deepest joy is all that you are. You are deepest joy, deepest joy is all that you are. Show the way. everyone. <sighs> it is a beautiful spring day. All right. How many of you grew up going to church or with some kind of religious training of any kind? Okay, just about everyone. How many of you remember when you first realized that some of it didn't sit quite right with you? that you might not be able to completely get on board with everything they were trying to teach you. You remember that? Somebody has to play. Yes, that person remembers. Well, you know how we have these weird random memories from childhood? For some reason, I have this vivid memory. Um, I grew up going to the Presbyterian church, going to Sunday school, and um, I must have been in about the second or third grade. And I remember we were learning about the Ten Commandments, and we had these worksheets, and they showed children, you know, transgressing various commandments. It was like, like little cartoons so that we could supposedly understand. And I remember I was looking at this one that showed a child who was envying a bicycle that his friend had gotten and was, God, I wish I had that bicycle, you know. And the lesson was that that was a sin, because we're not supposed to covet our neighbor's things and our neighbor's belongings. And I remember thinking, huh? That's a sin? Like every kid I know in school wants something that some other kid has. Are we all like horrible sinners? You know, it was the fact that it was framed in that, um, that framework of, of sin. Instead of saying, well, you know, you could talk about the reasons you should be grateful for what you have. That's not how it was framed. It was like, this is a sin. You shall not covet your neighbor's things. Instinctively, that teaching just did not sit right with me. <laughs> and I remember at that point thinking, no, this whole thing is bogus, man. <laughs> I was like six years old or something. <laughs> well, that kicked off a long history of me beginning to question the things that I was being taught in the church. And although I continued attending, I guess I had to, um, through high school, my heart wasn't in it anymore. And as soon as I was old enough, I stopped. Then I have another memory of being a young adult, and I used to teach ESL out in Hollister, and I had to commute every day so I would listen to talk radio. And it was probably KGO, because I loved KGO. I remember it must have been around Christmas, and they had this like um, Bible expert or whatever on. And he was talking about all of the things that we know about Christmas and how they're, none of them are biblical, right? Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. If there were shepherds in the field, it was probably spring. They changed it to the 25th so that it can coincide with these pagan festivals that were already in place and everything. And I was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was like another crack sort of opened up and I was like, 
wow, I, I just all of a sudden got that, like all the things that we had been taught weren't exactly the way I had thought they were. And so I began, you know, it's like a domino effect, right? I began to question all then of the doctrine that I had learned as a kid. Well, I'm very fortunate because soon thereafter I found unity and I began to find answers to a lot of the questions that I had. And I began to find teachings that, that didn't give me that ooh feeling, you know? And I, all of you have probably had that experience when you come in here and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I can get with that. I can get with that. I don't have to like leave pieces of it, you know, out in order to buy the whole package. And things started to make a lot more sense to me. So, you know, just like all of you, when I came into unity, I began to hear for the first time in my life that God is not an angry or judgmental God, but a God of pure love. You know, we used to have a thing up here that said God is love. And so I would look at that every week and that started to work into my consciousness and um, then I heard that there's only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, that that's all there is. There's no devil. There is no um, other force that is like grappling with God. Um, and then that whole thing started to dismantle in my mind about hell and the devil and everything. Interestingly, I should know better than to go off script, but <laughs> I used to have a lot of fear when I was younger, I was very afraid to be alone in a house or alone. Uh, I was afraid to get up and use the bathroom in the dormitory at night. I had all this fear, right? As soon as I really learned that teaching that God was all there was, that fear left me completely. So that just tells you how the fear is instilled in us of this boogeyman, this devil, that, you know, this evil lurking everywhere. Um, so I began to hear in unity that, I wasn't a sinner, you know, that humans were basically good. And I couldn't get enough of all of that because it all felt so good, like all of you, right? And I was an every Sunday attender from the get-go. So I didn't realize it, but I was engaged in deconstructing my religion. And deconstructing is just a fancy word for unlearning. Okay, but deconstructing sounds more intellectual. <laughs> I was beginning to unlearn the bad theology that I had been taught. And one by one, the things that hadn't felt right, that had made me want to leave the church, were being pulled apart. They were being deconstructed. And I could see that some of those things had not been right. And then it all slowly came apart. Luckily, I had found unity, and so I was learning new things that were replacing the old things, and I was reconstructing and rebuilding a faith that worked for me. So Vicki probably knows this. Deconstructing faith is a real popular topic right now in theological and religious circles. Everybody is talking about it, and everybody's doing it. So, you know, peer pressure, they're all doing it. We should probably be doing it too. <laughs> We already are. I mean, that you're deconstructing from the moment you walk into unity. And so Christian leaders and authors such as John Pavlovitz, um, Brian McLaren, Roger Wolsey, who has um, a Facebook page called The Kissing Fish, um, Jen Hatmaker, and the late Rachel Held Evans, just to name a few. There are a gazillion more. They are all talking about deconstructing faith. Of course, a lot of those folks are coming out of the evangelical churches, so they have a lot to deconstruct. And they're encouraging their followers to do this work too. <laughs> okay, let me say extreme evangelical. I don't want to paint all evangelicals with the same brush, but they, you know, there's, there's a lot there to work with and fundamentalism and all of that. So what exactly is deconstructing our faith? It simply means to examine what we learned in whatever denomination or religion we grew up in and see which things are just really not helpful. <laughs> you know, those things that just really don't feel good. I'm not just, it's not a matter of opinion. It's just these things are not helpful to us. To go around feeling like we're sinners all the time is not terribly constructive and helpful for us as human beings, right? So I'm talking about those things that are damaging that are harmful. They're not benign teachings. They are harmful, okay? And so we're looking at those things and, and picking them apart and seeing whether they hold up under scrutiny, right? 
And then if they don't, healing from them, doing that work to heal from them and letting them go. And then hopefully, because at that point a lot of folks just check out, but you're all here, so you're not doing that. Then it, the work is of replacing those things with new, healthier ideas that are helpful and supportive and are not damaging. And finding a spirituality that works for us. So when I say bad theology, and this is a term a lot of folks are using, so I'm okay using that, bad, the bad theology. <laughs> and it really is. Bad theology, I'm talking about things, again, that don't hold up under scrutiny. They don't hold up under scrutiny of biblical scholars, of religious leaders, of people that spend their lives thinking and learning and studying about these things, okay? And I'm talking about things that are harmful to us, that are damaging teachings. So, for example, like I said, the idea that we are sinners. Not that we sin because we do sin, but identifying ourselves as sinners and coming from that place, you know, that's not helpful. The idea that God and or Jesus are sort of always watching us and judging us all the time. Things like eternal damnation, you know, that, that, that boogeyman fear that made me not want to go use the bathroom at night in my dorm room, in my dorm, you know, that's, that's not helpful. And this idea that we must declare Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior in order to be saved from going to hell. Okay, it's not a terribly healthy um, thing to teach people. And perhaps one of the most twisted and damaging teachings of all, that Jesus died for our sins to take our place on the cross so that we might be forgiven. Okay, what is called in theological terms, penal substitutionary atonement. It even sounds ugly, right? <laughs> We're going to talk more about penal substitutionary atonement in just a minute. Not penile, penal. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, the, the day Michelle said penile from the pulpit. Okay. <laughs> I'm standing here. So Keith Giles, and there's a lot of these folks out there. Keith Giles is a former minister who left organized church many years ago. And he has now written books such as, and I love this, Before You Lose Your Mind, Deconstructing Bad Theology in the Church. I love that title. And he also has a podcast called Second Cup with Keith. And so he talks about all things related to faith and deconstructing faith. And he says that there are six pillars involved in deconstructing our faith. And these pillars are the six, six of the most common teachings in the evangelical church. And these are the ones that people are most often examining and scrutinizing as they do this work of deconstructing faith which is, of course, deciding which part of their faith's teachings they want to let go of and which ones they want to keep. Okay, the first pillar is the Bible, right? Now, for many evangelicals and, of course, fundamentalists, the Bible has long been an unquestionable authority, okay? They claim what is called Bible inerrancy, meaning the Bible contains no mistakes, and is the absolute and infallible word of God. If you've had that drilled into your head since you were a wee thing, that's a hard one to deconstruct. But this idea does not stand up to modern Bible scholarship. Um, and you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to get around that stuff. For instance, we know that the earliest account of Jesus' life, which is the Gospel of Mark, was not written down until some 40 years after Jesus' death. Okay? And the other gospel accounts come even later. And we also know that most likely, probably, none of the authors of the gospels um, were eyewitnesses to the events that they were writing about. Okay? None of them ever met Jesus. So how can they be without error? I can't even whisper something in Vicky's ear and have it go two rows back before it's going to be something different, right? Remember that game? What do you call it? 
the operator or telephone? Yeah. So how can it be without error? And this is, of course, not to mention the more obvious fact, once you start to look at the Gospels, that each of the Gospel accounts tells a substantially different story, and some of them even contradict each other. So like I say, the mental gymnastics you would have to do to like, oh, well, God planted that there to test our faith. You know? He did that when... Oh, God, i got to stop. He did that when he was planting the dinosaur bones so we would find them. And, okay. Uh, and this is being recorded <laughs> for all of eternity. Um, <laughs> so there's been a lot of Bible scholarship in modern times in the past few decades, especially like the Jesus seminar and such. And we now see the Bible as heavily edited and redacted. Okay, not to mention translated back and forth and all of this stuff. And not to mention that at the beginning, they were accounts of what people remembered about Jesus. That would be like my grandchildren trying to remember what Vicky used to say. You think they would get every single thing correct? And you think they didn't hear it through the filter of their own mind in the first place? Okay. So we know now that the Gospels are stories that people in which people were trying to grapple with what had happened and trying to make sense of it and understand it, not the inerrant word of God. Okay? So that when you start to deconstruct that, the whole house of cards begins to come down. The second pillar of deconstructing faith is this idea of eternal torment. I'm not going to go too much into that because it's just too ridiculous. Um, this idea of hell. You know, I mean, the idea that, uh, you know, we teach supposedly God loves us and we are God's children, and yet if we do one thing wrong, we're going to burn in flames for eternity. That doesn't even hold up, like, intellectually. What kind of God would send his children to burn in hell? Right? It sounds, starts to sound more like a device used by the church to control people and make them compliant. Yeah? The third pillar of deconstructing faith is penal substitutionary atonement. And again, this is a fancy term that theologians use for the idea that Jesus had to die on the cross to suffer in place for our sins. Okay? This doctrine is particularly harmful in my opinion because it teaches that we humans are so bad, so sinful and horrid, and God is so angry and disappointed with us that he was willing to send his only son to die this horrific death on the cross for us. That is a psychological landmine. <laughs> right? Where do you even begin with us? It tells us not only that God is eternally displeased with us, but that we are responsible for Jesus' death on the cross. And we are supposed to always remember that all the time, always remember how bad we are and we must be in eternally indebted to Jesus for doing that act for us. Wow. It's a wonder they get anyone to follow this faith. <laughs> right? Seriously. And the history of how that became part of modern Christian teachings is really complicated and I'm not knowledgeable enough about it, but suffice it to say that it is not biblical. It's not original to the original Christians. The original Christians didn't believe that. And it was only arrived at after several centuries of Christian thought where men in robes and silly hats and stuff, you know, <laughs> debated it with one another. I mean, I'm just saying. They didn't ask the women what they thought, right? A bunch of men in hats that Jesus would have just loved. <laughs> they, they, they debated back and forth, and they came up with penal substitutionary atonement. It was probably like, you know, uh, five people wanted it and four people didn't, so the fives got it. Do you know what I'm saying? It was a vote, literally, of whether that was going to be the teaching. Okay? Most people don't know this. Now, incidentally... If you have grown up with this teaching, as many of us have, 
please realize that many denominations are no longer teaching that. Okay? Most likely, depending on what church you grew up in, most likely if you grew up in a mainline Protestant church, they are no longer teaching that. Things have changed. And it may still be tucked away in their doctrine, but they're certainly not harping on it like they used to. The church is changing. And theologians and spiritual leaders and scholars are debating this and um, questioning the validity of that teaching. Okay, the other three pillars of deconstructing faith include the question of why there is suffering in the world. This is one of the ones that stumps people. We have people ask us that sometimes. In other words, if God is a God is a good God and loves us, why does God allow children to go hungry and horrible things to happen, etc.? That's, again, some mental gymnastics that often get done around that to explain why that happens. Um, the doctrine of end times prophecy. This prophecy did not have a good PR person because it has not happened. <laughs> you know, it has not happened. So that one, you know, sort of falls apart. And finally, the fact that when you start to learn about church history and such, which I don't even know that much about, but... The, the church's structure and practices turn out a lot of them come from paganism. Okay? So people, a lot of people don't know these things. I certainly didn't know all these things, but when people start to learn them, you can see how these things they have built their lives on begin to come apart. Okay? And when they start to unpack these things, especially the one that the Bible is not the infallible world of, word of God, their faith begins to unravel. Keith Giles does not include this in his six pillars of deconstructing faith, but I think he should. And I think that one of the most damaging teachings of Christianity and one that is causing the most people to want to deconstruct their faith and in many cases leave the church permanently is the prohibition on homosexuality. Of course, as our culture evolves and the rights of LGBTQ people are coming, have come to the forefront in our cultural conversations, Many gay evangelicals and their allies have been strongly challenging the legitimacy of this teaching. Okay? For example, we know that Jesus never said a single word about homosexuality. Okay? If it was that important, you'd think he might have mentioned it. He did say to love one another, though, <laughs> many times. And the Bible verses that are routinely trotted out to prove that God hates gays have been debunked by Bible scholars over and over and over again. Okay? So there's been a lot of deconstruction going on over the past decades. And now, again, probably the church you grew up in, most of the mainline Protestant denominations have changed their stance and they now um, are what we call open and affirming, which is really important because it doesn't just mean that gays are accepted in the church. It's not the love the sinner, hate the sin, but gays are affirmed as they're having worth and value just as they are and that they too were created by God and, um, and affirming that. And most Protestant Mainline Protestant denominations now ordain gay clergy and even trans clergy and um, perform gay marriages. Okay? So in this case, all of that deconstructing has had some really positive effects. Okay? Now, you may think that because you attend unity, and we don't teach things like eternal torment, end times, or Jesus dying for our sins, you may think that you don't have much to deconstruct. I mean, you gave up those ideas of a judgmental punishing God and the threat of burning in hell and the infallibility of the Bible a long time ago, right? Perhaps. But chances are that you still have some of that old theology lurking around in your consciousness. Okay? You can't undo, you know, a lifetime of... Um, indoctrination with just, you know, a couple years of attending unity. You start to undo it, but it, some of it is still in there. Now, in unity, you will frequently hear this referred to as embedded theology. And what that means is that it's embedded in our consciousness, but we don't know it's there. Okay? Those are the most dangerous kinds of things when they're in our consciousness, but we're not aware of them. 
And so unless we bring those things into the light and look at them and acknowledge them and then find a way to make peace with them and release them, they will come out at some point and they will cause us trouble. Has anyone experienced that? So one thing that can happen if you don't heal your unresolved feelings about the church is that it will affect the way you feel about all other Christians. Okay, I hear a lot of Christian bashing. I'm trying not to contribute to that today because I'm trying to be very specific that I'm talking about bad theology in the evangelical and fundamentalist um, sects. Um, so if we're walking around with this anger and resentment about the church we grew up in, that's going to affect the way we feel about other Christians. And we may feel antagonistic toward them. Okay, and this isn't helpful because we can find ourselves always in reaction to religion and to Christianity. We may even feel, I've heard some people um, describe it as being allergic. So some ministers don't want to even say Jesus or Bible or Christianity because their people are allergic to it. Allergic means they haven't done their healing work around it. And they're still in reaction to it. And we can be led to believe that the noisy ones who are always in the media doing bad things, that they're representative of all Christians. And we know that this is not true. Any more than jihadists and extremists and terrorists are the um, norm for all Muslims. We know that's not true, right? We know that. So why do we think that about Christians? Most of what we hear in the media today is coming from the fundamentalists and ultra-conservative evangelical Christians. And there's a whole world of progressive Christians out there whose, whose beliefs have evolved a lot since the church that we went to as children. And if we don't heal our religious wounding, we're going to go around feeling resentful and antagonistic towards them all the time, and that's not helpful. Another thing that can happen is that the bad theology that remains embedded in your psyche can ultimately affect your relationship with God. Okay, so it might be limiting how deep of a bond you are willing to forge with the divine because you still don't trust God entirely, right? So you may be um, holding some of yourself back. Well, God, you can have part of me, but you can't have all of me because part of me is still thinking that you're that other God that I was taught. And so um, if we don't let go of that problematic theology, we may still be harboring these deeply ingrained ideas of an angry, judgmental, or vengeful God, and that may be keeping us from having a full-fledged relationship with spirit. As more and more Christians do this work of deconstructing their faith, the question that often comes up is, but what about Jesus? Right? Many people who are unlearning the harmful doctrine that doesn't align with their current belief system don't necessarily want to lose that relationship with Jesus, which many people find to be incredibly meaningful, supportive, and fulfilling. And so folks are doing this same work of deconstructing around Jesus and the figure of Jesus. Examining what they've been taught about Jesus, how Jesus was painted, the image of him, and analyzing whether those things still hold up under the scrutiny of their deconstructing work or whether those things need revision. And then doing the work of coming to find a new Jesus, which I've shared about. I know this can be done because it happened to me. When I came in here, I had no interest in anything pertaining to Jesus. And now I think that Jesus is probably the most important um, of my spiritual inspirations and guides. So it can change. Um, Again, not the Jesus that has been co-opted by the right-wing evangelicals or the fundamentalists. Maybe not even the Jesus that you grew up with, depending on what your religious experience was like. But a new understanding of Jesus and a new relationship with Jesus that can feel authentic and supportive and in alignment for you with your current beliefs. Okay, I'm just going to say it. We don't have to throw the proverbial baby Jesus out with the bathwater. Okay, where's John when I need him? (laughs) All right. But why should we want to do this work? I mean, 
we don't really have to embrace Jesus to be spiritual, right? There are other teachings, other paths, other masters that we may resonate with. We can just choose one of them. Just be done with Jesus. So why would we want to do the work of finding a new Jesus? Well, I could give you a lot of reasons. But first of all, because so many of us have Jesus issues that we need to heal from, if that's what we grew up in, that work is important. Just leaving Jesus behind and, okay, now I'm a Buddhist, isn't going to heal that other stuff. Whether you want to be a Jesus person or not, you won't be doing the work of healing that by just leaving him behind. And so we have to, we have to do things like re-examine whether we think that Jesus is that person watching us all the time to see if we're sinning. Right? Does that still fit for us? If it doesn't, out of there. Now, depending on our childhood experiences and our life circumstances, some of us have a lot more to heal from than others. But we probably, even if you didn't grow up in the church, you still have stuff to heal from because we absorb it from the culture. Okay, also, because the majority of us grew up within a Judeo-Christian cultural framework, Jesus is our guy. You know, he is familiar to us. His teachings make the most sense to us within our Western culture and our Western minds. And we know that our Western culture has been deeply influenced by, Ju- by Judaism and Christianity and the, the foundational values and morals and worldview of those religions. So that's where we fit best. A lot of people do choose other religions, and that's fine. But there's an awful lot of learning you have to do if you're going to try to get into like an Eastern mindset and really understand that stuff. This stuff is already coming from the world, the Western worldview that we understand best. And this is true, again, even if you didn't grow up in an overtly religious household. Okay, third, this may be most important, is because you came to unity. And current discussion in our denomination notwithstanding, unity, at least I learned this when I first came in, claims Jesus as our way shower and our master teacher, okay? And Christian teachings are the foundation of Unity's movement. Our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, they offered a new interpretation of Christian teachings and a new way of reading and understanding the Bible. But there is no doubt that Christianity and the Bible were at the core of the Fillmore's ideas and the movement that they founded. You may wonder, you may consider whether there's a reason that you ended up in a unity church and not some other type of church. Finally, because Jesus is just a swell guy, there is no doubt that Jesus is an incredibly compelling figure. Again, not the Jesus with the little bobblehead on your dashboard, you know, but the Jesus as he is described in the Gospels. Okay, and we know now from Bible scholars that the gospel accounts are really the only somewhat, even somewhat reliable source of um, who Jesus was and what he taught. Okay, that's, that's all we have really is the gospels. And some of the other books that were found that are some more questionable than others. So this is the Jesus that is compassionate and loving, but also provocative and challenging. This is the Jesus who taught radical acceptance and inclusiveness. Okay? This is the Jesus who healed the lepers when no one else would come anywhere near them. He fed the poor. He dined with tax collectors. This is the Jesus who calls us to better behavior than we even think we are capable of. And he is unrelenting. We must love those who hate us. We must remove the log from our own eye before we go out pointing the splinter in someone else's eye. We must forgive 70 times 7. He didn't mess around. If we have two coats, we got to give one of them away to someone that doesn't have one. This is the Jesus of justice, of mercy, 
of kindness, and of unconditional love. And if we want to follow Jesus, follow Jesus in what they used to call at his time the way, which is a way to usher in a more loving, more just, and more equitable society, what Jesus called the kingdom of God, then we need to do the work of unlearning the bogus image of Jesus that we have been taught and that we see all around us and learn to embrace a new relationship with the Jesus of the Gospels. Now, after this work has been done, some people will find a Jesus that they can still call their Savior, although they may mean something totally different by that, something along the lines of, um, instead of saving us from burning in the eternal flames of hell, rather, Jesus may become our Savior because his teachings save us from a life of selfishness and unforgiveness because his teachings show us a way to live with compassion and openness and a clean heart. Others will find a Jesus that is simply a wonderful spiritual teacher, an inspirational healer, a master storyteller, and a provocative preacher who makes us think who makes us examine our own behavior and makes us want to be better people. And still others will find a camaraderie with Jesus, an elder brother type of relationship, where Jesus becomes a sort of friend or life coach who we can turn to for spiritual guidance or simply to study as a model of ideal human behavior. And finally, Jesus can be experienced as simply a highly evolved consciousness that when we commune with it, it can help us to elevate our own consciousness, an ascended master, if you will. So whatever emerges from this work of deconstructing and then reconstructing Jesus for ourselves, it will be a Jesus of our own understanding, a Jesus that makes sense to us, a Jesus that we can learn from, and that we can make peace with. Now, we can call ourselves Christians or not. That's a personal decision that really has nothing to do with following Jesus. After all, we know there are many folks, probably some among us, who study Buddhism and go to meditation groups, but they don't necessarily call themselves Buddhists, right? So whether we call ourselves Christians or not is not important. If we can remove the layers of bad theology that have been unfairly placed on Jesus over the centuries, we may be happily surprised by what remains. I know that I was. If you told me 20 years ago I was going to be a Jesus gal, <laughs> I would not have believed you. But it will that Jesus that we find will be unique and individual to each one of us. Whoever Jesus ends up being to us, it will be our own. And my hope is that as we continue exploring this topic through the next couple of weeks of Sunday lessons and the class that we're going to be having after the service and your own exploration of the book, if you should choose, that you will find inspiration and guidance for the process of deconstructing and reconstructing Jesus for yourself. This is a lifelong process, but my greatest wish is that you would come to find out for yourself who Jesus is to you what he means to you, how he inspires you, the ways he challenges you, and how his teachings can transform your life.
also just getting prepared for meditation now, getting comfortable, feeling the pew beneath you, supporting you, and allowing your body to just sink in a little bit. Just quickly scanning through your body and seeing if there are places that you are tense or holding, maybe clenching your jaw or maybe your shoulders are hunched, and seeing if you can breathe into those places. Taking a deep breath in, and as you exhale, letting go of those places of tension. And taking another deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax just a little bit more and sink a little more into the seat beneath you. And now just finding an awareness of the breath. Allowing each breath to bring you more and more into the present moment. Allowing yourself to just rest in this sacred, holy moment. And now just a, allowing an awareness of the presence of God to emerge within you. We know that God's presence is always in, around, and through us. It's our awareness of it that is sometimes lacking, and so we just turn our awareness to that God before me, God behind me, God above me and below me, all around and inside. See if you can sink a little deeper now, as if you were just going below the surface of a river, and you're just a few inches under the surface where everything is quiet and calm, and all the waves of your thoughts your plans for later today, they're just drifting by over your head. But you are here, resting in this place of calm, this place of peace. Just allowing everything to settle. Allowing everything to be just as it is. knowing that in this holy present moment, we have everything we need. We have the peace that surpasses all understanding. We have that loving presence of God holding us gently as we simply rest and breathe and simply be in this place of calm and quiet and peace in the silence.
reluctantly now prepare to release this meditation. We return to this room restored and rested and reinvigorated by that presence of God and spending time there and knowing that we can go back to that place anytime we want to. In just an instant, we can be there where all is peaceful and all is well and we can refresh ourselves so that we can come back ready to do life. And so we are so grateful for this reminder, for this community that supports us, and for these teachings, and we say thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. Unity of Monterey Bay is the collective consciousness and commitment of all of us who give of our time, treasure, and talent in order to sustain this spiritual community that is dedicated to transforming lives. We know that prosperity is a state of mind that finds blessings in every situation and abundance in joyous generosity. We transform all appearances of fear or lack into faith-filled peace of mind by shifting our attention to thoughts of gratitude for the abundance of God's good in our lives. As the ushers come forward, I invite you to think of something specific you're grateful for in this moment. And now, with our hearts and minds overflowing with gratitude, we breathe into the divine flow of God's good, trusting that we are enough, that we have enough, and that there always is enough to both have and share. We give thanks for all the ways you give, in person, online, monthly bank auto payments, credit card, our, our using, our, we're using our new uh, QR code cards and ask everyone to join in faith and gratitude as we pass the offering basket this morning by holding the basket and blessing, blessing it as, it as it passes to you. And now, please join me in our offertory blessing. I am, am an, an open, open channel, channel for, for God's, God's infinite, infinite good. good. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies everything I give and, and everything, everything I receive, I, receive, I am, am both, both blessed and, and a blessing. blessing. Thank, Thank you, God. Ah uh... 
All righty. If the uh, ushers will please come forward. Where's the we usher? <laughs> oh, <laughs> she came up for a snack and went back down. <laughs> oh, so it is with great joy that we bless and give thanks for these gifts and offerings that demonstrate our collective commitment to the spiritual work of love and transformation in our lives and in our world. We dedicate this offering, our lives, and this ministry to more fully expressing the Christ light that is the truth of our being and inviting all people to know God's love. Finally, knowing that one with God, all things are possible, we affirm together that the good is now, the rest is blessed, and the best is yet to be in our lifetime. Gently. <laughs> for our musicians, uh, for our music today, we want to thank Claudia Carraway, Richard Burdick, Daniel Namod, Charlie Thweet, and Karen Lafferty. And of course, Sue, who did an awesome job this morning filling in for uh, Denise and Marianne and myself singing. Um, okay, announcements. Spring dinner fling signups are happening. So you, again, you can sign up to host an event where you choose the date, the theme, the menu, the amount of people, um, the cost, and all of that. And um, it can be big or small. It can be daytime, nighttime, whatever. You choose. So um, you can sign up for that in the sacred grounds. Um, Church of the Wild is this afternoon at 2 p.m. And if you want to know what that is, talk to me about it afterwards. But we meet at Via Paraiso for some time out in nature. And um, finally, um, we will be meeting after the service downstairs for our class on Who is Jesus to You?, and I just wanted to show you, I'll show you more about this in the class, but this is the book. You don't need the book. Um, it's just if you're interested and you want to um, go deeper, but it's not necessary to have the book to attend the class. We're going to be doing our own thing down there. Okay. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to talk to me after the service. Okay. I know it's a lot today. So just a little, if you had to choose between the class and Church of the Wild, I'd rather have you come to the class. <laughs> Just saying, like if you don't feel like you can do the whole day, because Church of the Wild is going to meet every month, but this class is only going to be the next three weeks, so just if you had to choose. Or do it all, <laughs> like I'm going to. <laughs> all right, so as we bring our service to a close this morning, we are so grateful that you've joined us, whether you're here in person or you're watching us on Facebook or you're watching later on YouTube. We are so glad that you have joined us. We hope we've made you feel comfortable and at home in our unity community. And we want you to know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Chaplain on duty today is Sue is available to pray with you after the service. So we're ready to form our closing circle for our prayer for protection. I know it's like a mosaic or something. Special. Is there anything special today? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So if you weren't here yesterday, we did have the celebration of life for Brent Oaks. It was a beautiful service. And so let's just hold Brent in this loving, prayerful circle. Seeing him transitioning with ease and grace and blessing him on his way and knowing that he is off on a new adventure and we wish him well and we wish him Godspeed. And so will you please join me in our prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is well.